Live from the internet, it's the Dr. Tom the Frog Show! Hi-ho, this is Dr. Tom the Frog, and you're watching the Dr. Tom the Frog Show, where we talk about role-playing games! <clears throat> Again, we've got the, uh, the, the Jeff Brown's art as our beautiful backdrop. You should check out his Patreon. Uh, I'm excited because we've got two people on uh, this, this wonderful interview. Uh, now, one of them, uh, the camera isn't working, nor microphone, uh, but she's an artist, so that's okay. We could just see her amazing art. But I, I'm also super excited to have on uh, from, from movies like Excalibur as well as Jeffrey, which is one of my favorites, Patrick Stewart. How are you, Patrick? Dr. Tom, nice to meet you. Great. Uh, so, you know, you've been you've aged really well, Patrick, and I'm I'm really impressed by that. What's your secret? Um, I ate one of Michael Fassbender's kidneys on the set of the latest X Men film, and it renewed me as a human being. Wow. I, how many kidneys does he have left? Just the one. Just the one. Just the one. So that's my last chance at immortality. I guess I'll wait and see if I can get him on a set again soon. Great. That's really awesome. I did not know that Michael Fassbender had... I think Jen Martin would be pretty impressed with Michael Fassbender's powers, because she just thought he was handsome. In my spare time, I'm an uh, RPG writer. I'm not um, both oh. in my film and television career. Oh, well, well, let's just talk about the RPGs, because this is a pretty tightly focused show, as you can tell. We're, we're, we're hyper-professional here. Okay, cool. So... Yeah. I understand you've got a game. You've got a game called Deep Carbon Observatory, and is that some kind of Black Mesa science experiment gone wrong? And do I get a crowbar? Um, it's kind of almost like a Black Mesa science experiment gone wrong. The key point, the key part of the adventure is a gigantic underground complex, which is aeons old, and where things have very much gone wrong in the past. Um, you, I don't think there is a crowbar in it, though. No, so sorry about that. Oh man! So what? What is this? Is it? Uh, I know it's an OSR supplement. Is is it basically a like a cool dungeon crawl? It's uh, kind of halfway between being a dungeon and between being a small module. Its size, it's only about twenty thousand words and about a hundred pages of A5. But in terms of the density of ideas, there's enough there for to. I think a guy called Robin Zink played it with his friends. It took him like several months to get through the entire adventure. So it's quite a large adventure, and it's an add-on for any kind of. It's keyed for Lamentations of the Flying Princess, which is an old-school clone, but you um, can add it to almost any kind of old-school D&D, and it's been played with 5th edition as well. Wait a second. That sounds kind of her her heresy-ish. Is that heresy, to be able to play with 5th ed? How, how can you do that, Patrick? No one in the core of... Well, there's different factions of old the OSR. I'm with the hippie douchebag faction that doesn't really give much of a shit about... Where they, I'm sorry, I swore. I don't know if I'm allowed to swear on the internet. I don't really care about exactly which version of D&D you're playing. And in fact, if you haven't hacked together your own version of D&D from every possible version, including crap of your own, you're not really in the in crowd. So unless you're playing an insane ragbag of styles, then you, it doesn't really matter. So no, no one that I know would care about um, playing 5th edition with an old school module. Huh. Hey, I, I noticed that you might have a cool-looking shirt. Can you show us the cool shirt? Yeah. <laughs> Scrap made this. This is Scrap's illustration for the thing for Deep Carbon Observatory, and she's got an Etsy store. I was the first person to buy a t-shirt, and out of, I think, five people in total who bought them. But yeah, uh, this is actually one of my nicer t-shirts as well. I like it. Did you, do they come in frog sizes on the Etsy store? That's that's what I need to know. No, I don't think they do. The best bet would be to microwave one, uh, or shrink it with some like in water, maybe. That's the best you can get, I think. Now, I think the scrap here's got a cool picture that we're showing. What, what is this picture that we're taking a look at here? Oh, that's the tektite lens right at the bottom. The deep carbon observatory is like built inside a gigantic stalactite, or might, I forget which one it is, hanging over an impossible void. And right at the bottom is a kind of lens which allows you to peer through stone and uh, rock. And that's scrap's impression of the lens. It's also the front page of the um, adventure. That's pretty awesome. Oh, Scrap yeah. says there are kid sizes on Etsy, so maybe there is a frog size. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll have to go check that out. It would be a very small kid. So you humans are gigantic and kind of annoying that way. But that's okay. I, I'm, I can move fast. 
Uh, now, <clears throat> another question here is you've got you the two of you work together uh, all the time, and you've got this fire on the horizon. I've been reading the reviews, and, and some of them say it's a monster manual, and someone else says it's a book of poetry, and someone else I think they were they were taking illegal substances or something when they wrote. They, they wasn't mostly in English. So I'm a little confused. What is fire on the horizon? Uh, fire on the horizon is a pro song by Primal Scream. Our book, Fire on the Velvet Horizon is either a book of monsters or a really pretentious outsider art project, but it could be both, really, depending on how you look at it. Um, it's a hundred different monsters um, based on initial drawings by Scrap, then written by me, and then oftentimes redrawn by Scrap, and then assembled by her into these uh, weird, basically, art pieces of text and image, and then those scanned and turned into a book. Um, oh, Scrap's showing you there. That's the cover. Yeah, that's the I've got it right there. With the, that's the crazy tentacle monster that I read about. And then when the tentacles are really fast, that means it's young or something. And that is the uh, excuse me while I try and pronounce this because we invented a new letter of the alphabet for some of the monsters. It's the Ian Worm, which is kind of a creature from before time that built itself from shards of night that tore tore from the sky, and it's kind of a quasi Godzilla. Slightly Miltonian outsider monster that protects the Earth from other horrors, but may also be insanely dangerous itself. That is spooky. That is so spooky. I, I really. I, are all of them kind of crazy head trips like that, Pat? Yes. Um, I was trying to explain to a guy at work what I was doing on my with my with the job, and he I told him about monster manuals, and he asked me what my monsters were based on, and I kind of had to sit there for a second and uh, tell them that they're not really based on anything. They're as original as we can possibly collectively make them. And I would say they are probably the most original monsters to exist since the first monster manuals were assembled. Nice. And those weren't terribly original. They mostly just stole from existing folklore. Hey, Scott, do you think you could pull up another picture? I, I would love to see one more monster just because I want to have nightmares, mostly. Scrap's doing that. Um, the reason people think it's poetry is because my writing style is incredibly dense. In most cases, we went through like three revisions at least of the text to kind of create the monster. And then I kind of like to produce extremely closely interwoven rhythmic prose because I find that more interesting to write. Um, so in terms of direct use at the table, it's actually pretty bad to use directly. You clearly can't use it at the table, but it's more to like take a giant syringe of poetry and image and jam the monster into your brain so it lives there, and then you can create it easily without having the book around you. Um, but it's satless and you can't, can't use it at the table. In case anyone's watching, they're wondering if, if you can. You really can't. Oh, well, that's okay. I think I've got some imagination. That's kind of what the deal is with RPG. Oh, we got a new picture. I'm going to check it out. All right, well, so, so what is this that we're looking at now? <laughs> I think as well as Scrappy used like the most simple. Scrap has a wide range of image styles, ranging from the extremely simplistic to the the highly complex. And that's like the simplest monster that we have. It didn't even change once. That's the Azul. It's a kind of trilobite crab insectoid creature that lives um, in cumulonimbus storm clouds and rides lightning. Occasionally, they're made of a kind of glassy. Um, immaterial substance that only becomes real around static electricity. So sometimes they fall down to the ground and um, people chase them because you can use their bones and flesh to build weird magical items and things. And they race after the lightning, hungrily dashing past everything they can find until they can find a lightning strike just as it hits the ground, then maybe they can scarf rip it. And if you can grab onto one as it goes up the lightning, like it's climbing a rope, then you can end up on the storm cloud yourself. Although that would be a rather dangerous situation to be in. Yeah, I mean, once you get up to the storm cloud, what the heck are you going to do? Is, is there like... Exactly, yeah. Limited options exist there. Wow. I love that you guys have culture around the, the, the monsters. They don't just sit in a room and hang out and wait for dudes to show up. That's pretty great. Almost all of them are meant to be like a small world or quasi-adventure all on their own. And then as we were writing it, um, I started adding in voices of, you know, the sages in old monster manuals where they would say, sages say this monster keeps its gold in a certain place. Well, we kind of invented actual personalities for the sages who were talking about the monsters and used those imagined histories to link them together into a kind of meta-narrative. So there are three main characters who help to describe the monsters, and they all have their own life story and personality and weird quirks that show up in a kind of um, fractured way as you move through the book, because obviously because it's alphabetically arranged, you don't see their lives in correct sequence, and they interact with each other, and they have rivalries with each other, which they are, so they argue in comments and question each other's opinions as, as well. But that's just like a side thing we threw in for the fun of it. 
Oh wow! Is this is it, this last thing? Is this some of the the back and forth between the sages? There is that what were all the text boxes? No, the text is just my writing. The sages appear as quotes inside them, which you can't really see because it's quite small. Okay, and, but I, I think we get it. But that's dude, I have to know what is this one? Is this like a skinless monster thingy? Kind of. It's a that weird um, little thing you can see at the end of each of the letters. The end of the word is the letter or sound that we invented so that we could add it and create monsters with it. They kind of appear on the top of mountains and moonlit pools and they kind of emerge from wherever the hell it is they come from and slowly creep upwards. They're giant creatures then they slip down to the plains where they wander and knock over, open the doors of houses and like snatch people up and kind of luminescent and hypnotically beautiful to look at. But if you break it, um, they burn on contact with air. So they can be very badly injured. Too long as they die, um, their blood and bone boils inside them, which means a few minutes after its death, it can explode in a shower of um, uh, luminescent glass and alien flesh, which can kill anything nearby. Oh, well, that kind of kills the, the little bit of celebration from the party there. Wow. That's, that's pretty hilarious. Kind of like Harry Dresden, you know, when he's like, oh, well, you know, you could get me, but then... Awesome. Yeah. All right. Well, I, this is really great. I mean, Fire on the Velvet Horizon, Deep Carbon Observatory. Both of those are on your Lulu store, right? Yes, the Lulu Deep Carbon Observatory is also on our um, RPG Now store. If you want the PDF, you can buy that with the half copy for like almost no extra money on RPG Now. Oh, okay. But but now now the Fire on the Velvet Horizon. That's only a physical artifact, right? You can only yeah, get the book. A lot of people wanted PDF of it, but. We spent so long getting the images and the text together and making the mesh in a certain way that to make a PDF and to make it readable, and we couldn't make a non-readable PDF, we have to break the images and the text apart again. And it would, even though it would be pra more practical for people using it, it would be kind of like destroying a work of art, like taking a weird Cubist Picasso painting and put all the bits together so it makes it like a normal painting. It'd be kind of pointless. And even though people liked it and we kind of feel like we have kind of a moral duty to sell it to people because they asked for it, we also think they're fundamentally wrong <laughs> in wanting it. So we decided not to do a PDF and just force people to buy the physical copy. Um, because only then is it true art. Nice. All right. Well, we'll get some true art up in here. That's great. Awesome. All right, so enough for our talk about art, because, you know, we've got a show to do. I've got a serious question for you, Patrick. Are you ready for my serious question? Yeah. All right. Now, wait, hold on. Give me your serious, I've eaten Michael Fassbender's liver look of seriousness. Give me a second. Okay. I, you look totally serious now. I'm kind of scared. All right. If you had to choose one villain to be your nemesis, who would it be? Um, Dark Seed. You should always aim high, and he kind of encapsulates death and despair. So, taking that guy on, with it, even if you fail, which you probably will, it would still be kind of cool. You'd get a big grave marker. This guy tried to fight Dark Seed and died. That's kind of awesome. So, in the text, Scrap, do you have an answer? Scrap says, in caps, life. Life is her answer. Her enemy is life itself. Wow. All of it. That's that's a bummer. All right, well, it's been really great having the two of you on with your crazy monster setting stuff. That's so cool. Oh, hey, pimp on future crap as well. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, pimping future crap. Go for it. Uh, we have a book coming out with James Raji from Lamentations and Playing Princess called Ve uh, Veins of the Earth, which is, if you've, heard, if you've heard of Vornheim, it's a way to create your own Underdark S50 new monsters, which are illustrated by Scrap to a very high quality. It's like about 40,000, 50,000 words by me. It's like a whole underground world caves and strangeness. And it should be coming out hopefully by the end of the year from Lamentations of the Flame Princess. That is awesome. Thank you both so much for coming on the Dr. Tom the Frog Show. It was a wonder having you. Thank you for inviting us. You just watched the Dr. Tom the Frog Show. And we hope that you liked what you saw, yo. But if it was a big waste of your time, well, it's free, so that's not a crime. But if it was a waste of your time, yes, it's free, so that's not a crime.